Voltaire's famous quip, where some states have an army, the Prussian army has a state, has been frequently used in describing Pakistan and its military. This observation, originally applied to the Prussian state, reflects the unique position of the Pakistani army, not merely as a component of the state, but as a central pillar around which the state itself seems to be structured. Unlike in many countries, where the military serves under the state's command, Pakistan's situation is reversed. This is the most powerful man in Pakistan. Munir was among the decision makers involved in shaping Pakistan's response and policies at that time. This Who could replace General Bajwa? A lot of names are doing the rounds. The military's vast size, extensive business interests, and self-proclaimed role as the guardian of the nation's borders and ideology have elevated it to a central role in Pakistani society. The hegemonic position of the military in Pakistan's social and political landscape has never been more evident than in the current election year. The narratives surrounding the three major political parties underscore the military's overwhelming influence. For instance, the Pakistan Muslim League, led by three-time Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, who was ousted in a coup in 1999, claims that the army engineered his removal in 2017 to pave the way for Imran Khan. Khan himself accuses the military of aiding the Muslim League in a vote of no confidence in 2022, effectively sabotaging his premiership and hindering his governance. Whilst the Pakistan People's Party, with its roots in Sindh province, adopts a stance of wary skepticism towards the military establishment, which is predominantly composed of Punjabi personnel. This skepticism must be understood within its historical context. The execution of their charismatic Prime Minister, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, by the military regime of General Zia in 1979, is a wound that has yet to fully heal. What emerges from this complex web of political maneuvering and military dominance is a clear picture. Politicians in Pakistan seem unable to assert control over the powerful generals who wield significant influence over the nation. This prompts an intriguing question, especially when compared to India, a country that gained independence alongside Pakistan and has successfully maintained military subordination to civilian government. What factors contribute to this stark divergence in civil-military relations between these neighboring states? At the heart of Pakistan's military dominance lies a central figure, the Chief of Army Staff, whose position in the command structure grants him unparalleled authority, akin to that of a monarch within the institution. This starkly contrasts with the frameworks of most democracies, such as the United States, India, and the United Kingdom, where senior military leaders are primarily advisors without direct operational command. These leaders guide civilian authorities, who ultimately hold the reins over combat operations. Exploring the US military's command and control system illuminates this difference. The chain of command flows from the President to the Secretary of Defense and then directly to the commanders of the troops. This bypasses the service chiefs for operational purposes, positioning them as strategic advisors rather than commanders with direct authority over troops. Their influence lies in strategic planning and providing direction through bodies like the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which comprises senior representatives from all service branches. In such democracies, the structure inherently discourages the concentration of military power, making the prospect of a coup extremely challenging. The dispersion of command across various high-ranking officers, all appointed by civilian leaders, ensures no single entity has the operational leverage to unilaterally attempt a government overthrow. This necessitates a wide consensus among top generals, each commanding their troops, for such an act to be feasible. Pakistan, however, deviates markedly from this model, embodying a highly centralized command and control system within its military. The Chief of Army Staff stands at the zenith of this hierarchy, wielding complete operational command over the army. This includes direct oversight of troop deployments, military strategies, and overall force readiness. The Chief of Army Staff influence also extends to the career trajectories of senior officers, encompassing appointments, promotions, and assignments. This power allows for the crafting of a leadership structure aligned with the Army Chief's vision, ensuring loyalty and cohesion within the ranks. 
Upon assuming office, a new chief of army staff customarily reorganizes the corps commanders, securing their allegiance. Through strategic placements and promoting officers loyal to them, the chief consolidates control, transforming the army into a cohesive force under singular leadership. Within months, the chief of army staff commands an army of half a million, with no space for civilian oversight in any layer of the command structure. Thus, if push comes to shove and the Pakistani army chief finds himself backed into a corner, he does not hesitate to employ force to dislodge a sitting government. In this scenario, the elected prime minister, devoid of any influence over the armed forces, is rendered powerless. The last occurrence was in 1999, when General Musharraf staged a coup instead of confronting an inquiry and possible ousting for initiating the Kargil War without the consent or knowledge of the civilian government and without informing the Pakistani Air Force or Navy. For Pakistani generals, crossing the Rubicon is just another day in the office. Another key element of the Pakistani army's hegemonic stature is its extensive economic interests, which enable it to weave patron-client networks throughout Pakistani society. The chief of army staff wields dual roles, sole commander of a force of 520,000 soldiers and steering a billion-dollar empire with ventures spanning weapons manufacturing to banking and insurance, generating billions in revenue. The military business ventures operates under three main foundations, the Fauji Foundation for the Army, the Shaheen Foundation for the Air Force, and the Bahria Foundation for the Navy. These entities manage hundreds of independent ventures across diverse sectors, such as cement, fertilizers, cereals, IT, banking, and insurance. Notably, the Fauji Foundation stands as the largest of these conglomerates, boasting annual revenues of $3 billion and including two of the top 10 companies by market capitalization on the Karachi Stock Exchange, Fauji Fertilizers and Mari Gas. Land ownership represents perhaps the most lucrative aspect of the military's economic activities. The military owns approximately 12% of the country's land. The Defense Housing Authority, operated by the military, is the leading real estate developer in Pakistan handling the most desirable properties in Lahore, Islamabad, and Karachi. This system enables the military to acquire land at low costs, often from the government it oversees, and sell it at a profit, distributing urban property to strategic allies, including judges and journalists. The military's business operations serve as a mechanism for consolidating power, with the chief of army staff able to reward loyalty or sideline potential threats within the vast corporate network. This system of rewards and punishments strengthens the chief's control over the military hierarchy. Senior officers, aware of the financial benefits that come with favorable postings, rarely challenge the status quo, maintaining silence no matter how many blunders the chief is committing to avoid jeopardizing their chances of receiving lucrative appointments. One might question why a prime minister doesn't simply revamp the army's command structure or take over its vast economic holdings. Yet the political landscape in Pakistan, marked by frequent power shifts and coalition governments, presents significant challenges to such change. The absence of a single party, with the strength to achieve a two-thirds majority, combined with the entrenched patron-client dynamics between political factions and the military. The recent turmoil in Pakistan illustrates this point vividly, where a rift arose over the crucial appointment of the head of the Inter-Services Intelligence between Prime Minister Imran Khan and Chief of Army Staff General Bajwa. It's not the security agency, it's one man, the army chief. There's no democracy in that, uh, in the army. The army is getting maligned by what is happening right now. Khan's resistance to Bajwa's nominee highlighted an attempt to influence the military's internal command decisions, challenging the army's long-standing monopoly in appointing its commanders. In response, General Bajwa retracted his support for Khan's government, and it wasn't long before coalition partners signaled their readiness to desert Khan. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has been ousted. Leading to his ouster through a vote of no confidence. Furthermore, the military extends the benefits of its industrial empire beyond its own ranks. The distribution of land and economic incentives 
reaches not only loyal officers, but also other key societal groups that support the military's hold on power, including judges, journalists, and influential business figures. Consequently, sectors of civil society that traditionally resist authoritarian regimes, such as lawyers, journalists, and judges, may find themselves inclined to support military interventions, attracted by the economic perks that accompany such endorsements. Judges, in particular, are often seen siding with military rulers, motivated by a combination of apprehension and the allure of receiving land in prestigious defense housing authority areas. This practice effectively co-opts potential critics, weaving a complex web of incentives that bolster military dominance while dampening democratic dissent. Another key lever in the Pakistani army's societal dominance is the Inter-Services Public Relations Agency, or ISPR for short, led by a three-star major general, which is tasked with garnering national support for the armed forces. The ISPR engages in shaping public perception through social media and the production of popular dramas that glorify the army's sacrifices and vilify politicians as corrupt. These narratives are not merely propaganda, they also co-opt actors, social media influencers, and large media houses by offering them profitable roles in military-themed productions. The effectiveness of ISPR's media campaigns is undeniable. For instance, their efforts once elevated General Rahil Sharif to the most popular man in Pakistan, with some media figures and journalists openly calling for him to remove the democratically elected government and become dictator. However, the ISPR's methods are not solely about offering the carrot. They are equally proficient at wielding the stick. Journalists challenging the prevailing narrative face severe repercussions encapsulated within a legal framework that penalizes any critique of the military. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan was one of the first senior officials to visit the Islamabad home of investigative journalist Arshad Sharif who was killed in Kenya on Sunday night. This results in harsh penalties, such as lengthy imprisonments and large fines for criticizing the army, silencing debate on its commercial activities or events like the Kargil conflict and atrocities committed against Bengali civilians in the 1971 Indo-Pak war. The ISPR exerts a tight grip on the flow of information, ensuring that any deviation from military directives or attempts to highlight sensitive issues are met with intimidation, abduction, and even assassination, compelling journalists to halt their investigative reporting. Moreover, the Pakistan Electronic Media Regulatory Authority, PEMRA, possesses the power to silence dissenting voices by banning broadcasts that dare to cross established lines. Notably, Hamid Mir's influential TV show has faced multiple bans for challenging ISPR-approved narratives. In defense of the military, it's worth noting that civilian governments have also harbored a dismissive stance towards a free press, often cornering the media for shedding light on corruption or incompetence. Journalists find themselves in a precarious position, caught between the harsh reality of PEMRA's censorship abilities and the ISPR's formidable stance against dissent. Faced with the stark choice of succumbing to economic incentives or risking severe punitive measures, the majority opt for self-censorship. This silence deprives the public of crucial debates on the military's societal role, cementing Pakistan's status as one of the most dangerous countries for journalistic endeavor and highlighting the significant hurdles to free expression and press freedom. Pakistan's inability to control its generals and shift the balance of power from the military to civilian governance stems from a deeply entrenched system where the army acts as kingmaker. The Chief of Army Staff's absolute command over the military, coupled with the Army's vast economic interests and the strategic manipulation of patron-client networks, ensure that any attempt by civilian governments to assert control is met with formidable resistance. As another weak coalition government has been ushered, it seems as though politicians in Pakistan will be unable to put the genie back in the bottle, and the Pakistan Army will continue to be the power behind the proverbial throne. That's all for today. If you have enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Until next time.